Welcome to the interview series that sheds light on athletes and practitioners' perspectives on the healthcare industry as well as rehab in general. Um, I'd like to welcome our guest, Christy Block, aka Reach Rehab, former D1 volleyball player, former bodybuilder. You have your master's in physical therapy and you practice in Canada. Is that true? Yeah, correct. And it uh, looks like you play a little golf as well. Yeah, um, just a beginner though, but I try. Okay, nice. I've been playing golf more often too because of this COVID thing and I've been shanking every ball. So you're going <laughs> to have to help me with that. Um, I think I have a good coach. So. Oh, nice. My you fiance, do. not an actual coach, but. Awesome. Yeah. Feel free to tell me about yourself. Um, let's see. I'm also like really into football right now. So, um, like for me, I just like to be active and I love like, like um, yeah, anything that's challenging, something new. Um, that being said, like I did play volleyball, but I just wanted something different. So yeah, I like a challenge. I'm a continuous learner. Um, I, I guess it's weird when you ask like to speak about yourself, it's one thing, but I can say like other people would say that I'm like outgoing. Um, I'm fun and upbeat and yeah, I try to be positive every day. Nice. I yeah, like yeah. that mindset. How about you? Um, <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I mean, I went to UCLA, played a little baseball there on the club team, played baseball four years of high school. Um, I had my own YouTube channel based on powerlifting and fitness for a while. Cool. So I'm really immersed in that world. And that kind of uh, exposed me to the rehab industry. And I figured why not do that for a living? I like anatomy and kinesiology. So yeah, cool. Uh, cool background. Yeah. Do you still powerlift? Um, not, not too much. I actually haven't touched a barbell since the pandemic started, but yeah. I do have dumbbells here and I've been trying to run a little more. What yeah. about you? Um, I was, and then it kind of hurt my shoulder a bit. And so now I've just kind of been more rehab focused, but we definitely right before kind of COVID became like a big deal. Uh, we went and bought an Olympic bar. So that was kind of kept me, my sanity during COVID. So yeah. Do you guys have a garage or do you have a backyard? You just in the basement. Yeah. We, um, yeah, it's like, so we have an Olympic bar and some free weights. It's not like anything special, but it was like, yeah, it's a, a mini gym. You could call it. Less is more. That's all you need. Is that yeah. also your studio quote unquote? For um, your videos? Yeah. That's where I would like take my videos and stuff for reach rehab. Uh, actually my fiance was kind enough to paint it with me because we live in a like older 1963 home I guess it's not that old but and like everything was like brown and and orange so um so yeah we kind of just like painted it up and that's where I do like my my content creating I guess yeah great that yeah. looks very legitimate I thought Thank it was like an actual studio or clinic really oh, okay that's cool yeah no it's just in the good old basement and I just got to get some good lighting in there <laughs> nice speaking yeah. of your social media page what's the meaning of your handle your Instagram handle? Like my reach rehab? Yeah. So last year I went to Uganda and um, it just kind of like changed my mindset on like outreach to people for physio. And uh, what, what we did there is we distributed wheelchairs to people um, that yeah need wheelchairs because there's not a whole lot of access there. And what really blew my mind is even just like spending 10 minutes of educating someone on well, I'll go in more depth. So there's a, a little boy, um, he was having trouble walking and the mother thought that he needed a wheelchair. And here we found out after just kind of talking with her a bit more that she had been carrying him too much and that he just hadn't developed those muscles to have the strength to walk. So that this is like life changing to me because they were going to put him in a wheelchair and really all they need to do is get him, you know, strengthened up again and crawling again and then eventually walking again. So to me, it was like mind blowing that all it needed was 10 minutes of education and it would drastically change that, that little boy's life really. So I actually started the page. I mean, COVID also helped cause I was kind of like really missing, you know, giving exercises and feedback. And, and I thought, you know what, if 10 minutes could impact that boy's life like that, what could 10 minutes of online or like me putting some content out there do for other people who can't get get physio so that's why i called it reach rehab is because my goal is to help reach people that don't have the ability to go to a clinic um to get the help they need so that's kind of where 
it came from, I would say, yeah. That's so inspirational. When I, I first saw your handle, I took it literally and I thought you meant, oh, we're helping people reach for objects and cabinets. Let's yeah. say we have a rotator cuff tear. <laughs> I mean, that definitely like helps too. I had a few people say like, like reach my goals. And so kind of like applies in multiple different ways, but yeah. 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 So I like that perspective too. Got it. So the main focus is like a geographical reach. You're trying to reach as yeah. many people as possible. It's really cool. Absolutely. I just, honestly, I just love to give back and help others. And maybe in the future I can take it further and, and even more, try to promote it to um, more, more than just what it is right now. Like I'm still building it, but that is my overall goal is to make sure that, yeah, like if someone has a phone, then they should be able to get help for themselves and, and be independent and yeah, get better without having to always go in clinic. So you started the page during the pandemic or right when that started or right before uh, that or kind of at the end. So I was a little hesitant just cause like, I mean, I do like, I am outgoing and, and things like that, but I, I don't know. I just was a little nervous to put myself out there. Right. So I know that um, feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also, I guess why I didn't put it as my name is I didn't really want the focus to be on me. I wanted the focus to be on rehab and, and anyway, so it took a little while, but people kept asking me questions during COVID and they're like, please, like, I just, I need some help. So finally I was like, you know what, I'm just going to make a page and I'm going to go for it. And now I haven't looked back. So what is your end goal with that? Do you want to monetize it eventually? Or are you currently yeah. monetizing? I, I don't know what my end goal is. If I'm being honest, I think like, I'm building it to give back. So that's like my main purpose right now. Maybe in the future, like this is what I've kind of talked about with my fiance is, so we were supposed to get married this year, like a few weeks ago, actually. So like- Oh, congrats. Thank you. I mean, something happened, obviously. Well, COVID. So we're gonna, we decided to get married next year. And anyway, we one day we want to have a family and all that. So my goal maybe in the future is maybe that could be an option for me once I have kids. And if I have to be at home more, then maybe I could like monetize it that way. So, I mean, right now I'm just trying to like build the page and if people reach out to me, I can, they can message me and stuff, but I am working full time at Sable Flirt Health and Rehab Center in Regina. So, um, but yeah, so maybe in the future it could become something like bigger than what it is, but I would love to do more of that because I think nowadays more and more people are like, they like online, like they like that they don't have to leave their home. And a lot of people, like I said, don't have access to it. So I think it would be a great outlet. I was talking to another therapist who works in Toronto and he was saying he makes an exercise library for his patients. And then, I mean, everyone can see it. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone, which That's is great true. about it. I have like, I have like, cause if I already have that content created and it just does seem easier if they're comfortable with it, I will just be like, Hey, check this out. And they're like, wow, that was so much more useful versus like a paper with the exercise. So yeah, I have started to notice that. How many years of experience do you have and how many different settings have you been in? So I've been, it's almost coming on five years, which is crazy to say out loud. I feel like, I don't know, time flies by, but, um, I've worked in kind of like a private practice setting and I've been in two different clinics. So one was in like a city that's about two hours away. Um, they're very similar. I would say the only difference is that the previous clinic I was at was maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and then the clinic I'm at now is like pretty busy. We have like quite a few therapists. So a lot of people coming in, in and out, but they both um, have like outpatient type people. And, but to, like, honestly, I see a bit of everything. Like I don't just treat athletes or like there's, well, I consider everyone an athlete to be honest. Like that's the way I look at it. Like, let's say there's a 60 year old that wants to run a marathon next year. Like he's an athlete, right? So <laughs> But, um, but I kind of see a bit of all ages. Like right now I'm treating a five-year-old. So like, it's pretty cool. Based on what you've told me so far, I can see you as a pediatrics therapist in the future. Really? Wow. Just based on what you said about reach rehab and, you know, a 10 minute conversation. And then you're talking about having kids and now you're talking about the <laughs> six-year-old. Are you I mean, interested in pediatrics? It's funny you said that. I, so in my, like, when I was in school, I did a clinical placement. I actually like struggled. Like I thought I would enjoy it more, but I think it's cause like, I like to communicate with my patients and, True. and with children, it's like so much of it is observation. And I think, I mean, I would totally like try it 
just to see a change if I like wasn't if I needed a change in, in what I'm doing. But I really love the area I'm in now. But what really actually um, motivated me was actually neuro rehab. Like if I were to ever change, which I don't, don't see myself doing anytime soon, but it would be neuro, like um, traumatic brain injury, stroke. Like it was just so mine. I don't know. Like I would get too emotional when I was dirty on the placement though. Like going through seeing someone not walking and then walking for the first time after a yeah. stroke. Anyway, it just is so cool. Like I just love my job. I don't know. <laughs> As therapists, I think we have this desire to see people objectively improve. And yeah. sometimes when I was talking to the therapist yesterday, I was saying how if you don't see immediate objective improvement, it's hard to give it your all if you yeah. know there's limited potential for growth. Um, in pediatrics, I feel like, yeah, you can influence them when they're young, but you don't really see the results till later on when they're older. I mean, that's a good you point. Can, you that can would really change that. Yeah. I, I think you're, uh, changing that inflection point, but you don't really know if you made an impact truly until they're all grown up. That's a good point. I mean, point. in certain cases. Yeah. Versus like a torticollis, you could probably see objective changes and yeah, but yeah maybe I, I am very impressed with people in that career field. I remember my clinical instructor, um, yeah, going through all the different postures. And I'm just like, even though I do a lot of observation, obviously, as a physio now, I, um, I don't know, I just get so much out of like the subjective too. Like I feel like so much of, and that's why online is kind of good too. It really forces you to listen to your patient and what they're telling you. And when you put yourself out there online, you have to be, diligent and you you have to know your your shit yeah because if you don't true. i mean people will uh crucify you so. that's true that's like i i don't know it's it's been interesting because um i went into this thinking you know what putting myself out there and have to be ready to take positive and negative feedback and if anything if i've ever, like let's say another therapist um connects with me and gives me feedback it's like i don't know i actually i really like it i i get excited and and it's like really great way to just again, keep learning. Right. Yeah. So I love it because then I, I love to learn. So it's been actually, instead of thinking, like, I always thought people would just be a little meaner. Do you know what I mean? Like, like there's always going to be negative feedback, but if anything, it's been like really positive feedback so far. And I don't know. I've just really appreciated the page for that. Definitely. And I think no matter how much experience you have, you're always learning. So that's a great mindset to have. The minute that's you true. think you know everything, I mean, you're done. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, lots to learn still. So, How have your experiences as an athlete helped you uh, as a therapist? Mm. I would say just like having been, having been through an experience like that, you kind of have, I don't know, you just, it's easier to kind of connect with people that are in the same situation. I've actually just recently got a, a few more athletes than I would normally have had on my, um, in my schedule. And I feel like it's just easier for me to connect with them and be like, I understand the other pressures going on in your life. And, and it's just a great way to connect with them and have them understand that, Hey, she gets it. And if, she, if, if she made time, like I can make time, like, or, or I don't know, it's just that connection with that person. Because I think a lot of times it's easy for us to just say, do this, do this, do this, give them an hour of rehab, but that might not really be realistic, like realistic if they're doing two hours study hall and they have, two a day practices. And so I think it just helps me connect better with them maybe. And, um, and then I'm better able to decide on, okay, what are they actually going to get out of and really isolate the exercise that they need and that they will actually do. I love how you take their personal lives into account. Whereas an amateur therapist would just be like, stick to this program. If you don't, I mean, it's on you. Whereas you <laughs> yeah. kind of take the external factors into account. What about technicality wise do you see mm. um i mean your experience in sports did that help you with like movement analysis or you yeah. know analyzing I'm glad you brought that up i guess that's true like i would say that that has helped me quite a bit especially obviously with volleyball but just like observing movements in general um i would say that has helped me like with technicalities of like this is where your arm should be. This is you're swinging improperly. Um, this is 
what's needed for baseball. You need more internal rotation. I mean, I would definitely say that helped me. Um, but it, in terms of like how I observe movement and like tech technicalities with like powerlifting and stuff, I would credit my strength training coach. Like I would say, I feel really blessed that I had that experience. Cause I think I was 17, would have been 17 training 18 when I first went to play volleyball and I was a completely new lifter, like, which is bad. I wouldn't recommend that for anyone that's like going to go play Div one level. You should be lifting prior to that probably. Yeah. Um, but at least I hadn't developed bad habits by then. So it was really good to like kind of learn from the best, like right off the hop. And I feel like that kind of molded my background. So since I was 18, I kind of got all that, that person in your ear, like, don't do this. Like, this is better. This is more efficient. You're going to get more power, more force learning how the hips like drive the power. And so I think that I definitely kind of got pretty lucky or, or I'm blessed. Like I'm blessed that I had that experience to be like the base before going into physio and then going into physio. It's like, Oh, and it's just like so cool to put it all together. Right. I'm just going to take a guess here. After you stopped playing volleyball, you got bored and then you got into lifting. Is that how the, ignition of the bodybuilding lifestyle mm -hmm. came into play so bodybuilding came into play because or is that your question kind of like what got me yeah. Into that? yeah yeah what transition what, what was the transition like the for me it was i definitely kind of got bored of volleyball a bit not bored just like i needed a change like because in college it kind of becomes a job and i loved it like i really loved it but it just sometimes you need a break right so for me actually it was that the amount of sitting i did in school like I'm sure any physio can remember and relate or anyone else that's in a master's program can relate to how much sitting and studying you're doing and looking down. And I just felt like my posture was bad. I felt like weak and I didn't really keep up with exercising a lot during the program, which I'm embarrassed to say, because I think it's so good and motivating when I see people, they're still studying and they go and they take that break. And I wouldn't say I did that. So I just felt like I needed to get back into routine and I missed that team atmosphere. Yeah. And like the person I worked with someone who was competing and she's like, yeah, I lift with someone else every day that's on the same team. And it just seemed like a team atmosphere. So that's what actually drew me in is I was like, Oh, I want to get strong. I want to be part of a team. Let's give it a try. In regards to the team, was it like a lifting team and did you do any competitions or uh, um, shows or anything? I did, was it two or three? I think I competed in three shows. And I would say like, we were part of like all the same team that um, like you'd have a coach that would coach you on like, not necessarily how to lift. Cause like, I feel like I knew how to lift. It was just coaching on like to keep you on schedule um, more so like the meal plan. Like that's a lot of people that bodybuild know that that's like a lot, a huge component of it, right? That's the toughest battle. Yeah. And that was actually the coolest thing I think I took away from bodybuilding was learning about how food, how impactful food can be. And, um, but yeah, anyway, so that I would say actually it wasn't as much as it like, like, it's not like we would all go lift together, but it was like, you just had that support system. Nice. Yeah. But I competed in three shows. And then after I just found it was like, I don't know. I'm pretty competitive. And I just, I think it was too much for me. And I was like, like, uh, the first show I did well, the second, like I, I did well, I don't want to get into it, but, um, but it just wasn't for me after, like, I, I felt like I got my strength back and I just wanted to do something different again. For me in the powerlifting realm, I did two competitions and I did well for me. You know, I was just trying to beat myself, so to speak. Yes. And then after those two, it was like, where's this going? Like, am I going to do this for a living? There's no yeah. money in this, first of all. And I mean, I felt as if I was getting too big and I was creating hypermobility in certain uh, areas. And I just feel like I couldn't move freely. Yeah. And I, I just, I, I just felt too bulky and I wanted to be more functional. So I kind yes. of backed off a little bit and that's how I kind of got out of that mindset as well. But you use that mindset, like the training mindset to apply to other areas of your life, which I'm yes. sure you did as well. Like I, I, I didn't realize, I think that I was that self-disciplined as a person. I think that, um, it taught me a lot about, yeah, like self-discipline and sticking to a program. And so those kind of things you can apply to anything. Right. So 
uh, especially rehab. So if you, yeah, if you stick to the plan and you trust in the process, all those things. Is your clinic insurance based? Um, I mean, yes, I'm trying to, okay. If, could you rephrase that question? Um, I mean, do you mostly, I mean, in regards to reimbursement, is it through insurance companies or do you do yeah, out of pocket? Like, I would say typically it is, but like a lot of people end up paying out of pocket too. But How would you most insurance companies should cover like a certain amount. It just depends on the company. How would you say insurance and documentation requirements affect the way you treat? Hmm. So like, I don't think it should really affect the, it shouldn't really change anything. Every, Good answer. every person that comes Good in. Answer. <laughs> it's a I trick mean, question. Every, okay. Cause I was like, I <laughs> like every person that walks in, I just, I don't even like to look at whether they're really private. I mean, we know if they're like SGI or WCB, then we have to be a little more detailed in our assessments, but what is that? Is that a Canadian um, thing? Oh, I don't know. I'll explain. Yeah. Um, so SGI is like if they get a motor vehicle accident, so then they should be getting covered through SGI and they will pay for like their rehab so that they can get them better. Okay. Um, or it's it's kind of like PI. Oh, okay. So it's just okay. called something different. What does yeah. SGI stand for? Saskatchewan Drivers Insurance. Oh. Yeah. I had to just think of that because I always say just S SGI. Yeah. And WCB is Workers Compensation Board. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What's your stand for? Um, personal injury. Okay. PI. Okay, that makes sense. PI. And yeah. WC workers comp. Okay. Okay. So kind of same thing. Yeah. So we just have to be a little bit more detailed when, when those kind of things come in. But in my opinion, every person that walks through that door, like I, I don't even look at that. I just treat the person as a whole and yeah, go from there. Love it. What percentage of your colleagues would you send your family members to if they got injured? Any of them. Any of them. Okay. And we have a lot of colleagues. Like we have a lot of people, but, and maybe I'm being overly confident, but honestly, I, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm biased, but every therapist there has so much to offer. Um, and I love to learn off of them and I would feel very, com I would way rather send my family members to them versus me treat my, uh -huh. I don't think, like I have treated my family members, but uh, I don't, yeah. It just works better when you have someone else telling them what to do instead of like me. <laughs> yeah, I've tried to tell my dad to do certain things and he just won't listen. It's just the family dynamic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me rephrase that question. What percentage of your former classmates would you send your family members to? Not, not mm. working at your clinic, but I mean, yeah. just a question that highlights the quality That's a hard of the one um i would say like probably 90 percent, maybe 95 wow that's a that's a good number but i'm pretty positive person i don't know because yeah. I, I honestly just feel every like everyone treats differently right so there's always going to be something that one person's better than the other and that you can take more away from so but obviously i would refer if someone's like way better at hands-on and they need more hands-on refer over but I don't know. I'm fairly confident. Like our master's program is excellent and yeah, I'm confident in them. And, and I feel like the people I graduated with are very talented and knowledgeable. Does Canada have a doctorate program or is it only master's? So the master's program is like, apparently I was talking about this with another therapist and I believe it's equivalent. So it is interesting to see on Instagram, right? Because people are always like, Oh, Dr. Christie or doctor, you know, like whatever. And they're like, Oh, do you not have your doctorate, but it is the equivalent. And I don't know why they have the technicalities of the changes in the names, because I believe it's the same amount of schooling. Um, I, either maybe we're just behind in, in that in terms of like, yeah, I don't, anyway, I don't know, but I did six years and like a few weeks of schooling. And I believe a doctorate is probably the same or around the same. Or you did could you six tell me? Years? I mean, four years undergrad, you're saying? Sorry, four years undergrad and then two years and like, a few weeks for the master's program. Got it. Um, yeah, ours is three years, but to be honest, in oh, my so maybe opinion, this a bit more. yeah, but I mean, I'm not a huge fan of the curriculum. I think there are certain classes that are not necessary. I mean, for example, we have professional practice, which is fine. We have to, yeah. Yeah, it's necessary, but I don't think three classes on professional practice are going to really change you as a therapist. 
I wish they uh, included like electives instead of yeah. those classes. Like if you knew you were going to go into the outpatient setting, maybe you could take like two more orthopedic classes or something like that. Yeah, that that's that'd be smart. I like that idea. Yeah. I definitely feel like the thing that I would have liked to see more in the program is actually seeing the conditions. And they did do this a few times where they bring someone in that had like, a, like let's say hypermobility is an easy one, but like a torn ACL or something so that we can feel that versus just like, I don't know, but that's really hard to do is just get people to like come, come in. Like I get that, but that would have been nice versus like when in your first year you're out, you're like, is this torn? And it's like, <laughs> Dude. And that, now it's easy. It's just like, oh yeah, it's, torn. it's like coming off. <laughs> yeah. You're like, all right, is it torn? No, but I, I feel like, um, even like things like that. Um, but I, yeah, I felt comfortable with the two years. It, it did seem like sometimes hands-on, like if you're with a partner that it takes a little longer, then it's like, they're like, okay, let's continue. And you haven't even had a chance to like feel, I, I'm like really a kinesthetic learner. So I love that hands-on. So I would say, I don't know. Depends like two years versus three years. Really. I don't know. To me, it was more so you just got to get out there that first year and just put your hands on a knee, put your hands on a shoulder. And that's, what's going to help. I 100% agree with you. I remember in our labs, we would just work on our classmates who are completely healthy and it's just <laughs> like, yeah, you can practice on them, but it's not like a, it's like a dummy. It's like doing CPR on a dummy pretty much. That's a very good point. It's like all these people are like, well, not, well pretty much in amazing shape so you're like when you get out there you're like oh like this is this is what it feels like okay it's like <laughs> that stiff so it's a quick that first year is so much of a learning curve yes um, I'm, I'm happy to be out five years <laughs> i think in the first year i thought patients were a lot healthier than they were just because i i mean that's the all the practice we got we did have some days where they sent in guests and stuff but for the most part yeah. um how has coronavirus affected your work? Are you doing telehealth or are you seeing people in person? So I was off of work for probably about a month and a half, maybe two months. And then our, our office did provide um, telehealth, but they, we have a, like multiple therapists. So um, they asked, okay, let's just have a few st step up first. And there was a few that really, really wanted to and were gung ho about it. So I was like kind of on the fence. I didn't know if I, like, I was hoping we'd get back to work quickly. So I was kind of just like, I think I'm like, I was teeter tottering waiting. And then sure enough, we ended up going back to work. So I never actually did get into it. I did consider it, but we already had other therapists that were really interested and they did, but we do still provide telehealth now, which I think is really cool um, for like people out of town or people who are, um, who do have coronavirus if they do, which Regina has one case. So I get it, but, <laughs> um, but no, we do provide it. I never ended up doing it. Got it. Uh, what is one diagnosis that you love treating and what is one diagnosis that you're not a huge fan of? Um, I mean, I, I love it all. Like, I mean, change is just nice, right? I don't really like every time there's an ankle, I'm not like, yes, another ankle, you know, like it's just, if there's like a lot of knees and necks lately, then I'm like, oh, I could just use a back and a shoulder, you know? So, okay. I, so like a uniform distribution. Yeah. I like a uniform distribution. Change is good. It's just like any job. If you are too repetitive you just need to change up but i mean i do like shoulders and like knees but it always changes right then then i'll tell my fiance i wish i could just treat some more necks you know so yeah uniform change and then the other question was you said the ones i don't like or yeah you feel uncomfortable treating um sometimes like spinal ones it's just kind of a little more tricky with some nerve distributions and those just sometimes take a little bit longer um and and the patients kind of get a little bit more like sometimes they can get frustrated, but I don't know, but that's also like nice. Cause it's a challenge. Um, and again, like, I like a challenge and, and it's all about the process, right. And trying to guide them through that. But I would say that those are a little bit more complicated. And then what treatment do you see over prescribed? If you've noticed anything. Um, I'm trying to think. For example, uh, I interviewed someone and he said glute strengthening to address knee issues, maybe something okay. along those lines. I mean, My if that thing helps would out. be like the term sciatica, like uh, anything could be sciatica apparently nowadays. So I, that I like tend to try to steer them away just from that term in general, cause that's such a general term um, versus like a radiculopathy or, you know, other issues. So um, I would say 
that that's just too generalized. We got to get more specific with what's happening. Is it pure form syndrome? Is it at from, coming from the back? Yeah. Um, so that one is like a, one of them that I'm like, oh, here we go. But it's just about education and yeah, getting more isolated to the specific problem. Funny you said the glutes. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's true. That's like the big thing right now is like firing your glutes properly. And, and I think I did a post on that even. So, but it's because people are interested in it. But um, I would say, yeah, probably the sciatica one. I think glute strengthening is so necessary and maybe not even glute strengthening, but glute re-education of yes. the, I mean, the neuromuscular re-education. Yes. And it just helps so much offload our backs, right? So, so many people have like chronic back pain or back pain. So um, strengthening the core, strengthening the glutes, like anytime there's an, a dysfunctional joint, always looking above and below or the surrounding joints is going to benefit. So Thank I you. love that everyone's on the glute phase right now. I'm like, right on. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last question. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, do you have any personal experience with physical therapy and how did it go? Um, I do. And I feel like I'm like an injury prone person myself, but Are you? From, I don't know. I'm kind of, yeah, but I think it's cause I push it. Like I'm just one of those people that I I'm a black or white. So kind of person, like I just go for it, you know, in football and but again, I believe in rehab. So, so then yeah, I'll do my physio, I'll get better. And, but anyway, I would say my very first experience with physio ever was when I was quite young and it wasn't a good experience, which is kind of actually one made me interested in like, maybe I could do this. I feel like I could do this better. Like, and for me, it was like, they just loaded me with so many exercises. It was like 15 exercises at one point. And I remember I was like 16 years old. And that's why I like to try to take like, who the person is into account because I didn't do them. And, and I, then I was scared to tell her I didn't do them. So in the future, like when I, when I treat, I try to ask them like, Hey, do you like this? Are you, are you even doing it? Like trying to be super personable with them. So they feel comfortable to be like, you know what? I really don't like this one. And cause there's so many different things you can, you can give. Right. So, um, so that was my first ever experience. And then my second physio experience was just amazing. And, and it helped with my pain and, and it made me really want to be a physio, but in general recently, um, yeah, I'm just getting treated for my own uh, shoulder injury, R really working at, cause my, our jobs obviously were really bent over, um, and postures can get bad. So really trying to be like preventative with strengthening my back and I'm having a great experience. Of course, like, uh, I love physio physio is the best. Everyone should do some. <laughs> One mistake I made as a, beginner therapist and I still do to this day. So I have to check myself is giving people too many exercises just because I feel like I want to address everything. I don't yeah, want to just get address excited. one. Yeah. I feel like I need to help you uh, to the greatest potential. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can be overwhelming and you have to consider their perspective, especially if the patient is not an athlete, if, if the patient is not very active. You know, yeah. And, they're, they're I love gonna... honestly just asking them like usually people will be straight up if instead of being like are you doing your exercise I'm just like do you like this or like <laughs> then sometimes you can tell right away they'll be like like well and you're like yeah they're not doing them yeah. or if they're like yeah like I really feel like it's activating you know and then you kind of go from there and patients will ask you they'll say can I have more the patients who are like I don't know so that's what I love about it is like connecting with that person and seeing what they are willing to take on. And if they, if it's overwhelming, they're not going to do it. I lied. One more question that segues sure. off the previous one. What caused the injury that sent you to PT in the first place? Um, I mean, I think this has been a longstanding kind of thing. Like with my volleyball, I had like, I mean, that's a lot of um, right shoulder work. So I think I probably had some like underlying weakness, but I would say it was like probably just like my bad postures from work and even just in general. Um, and then what, I don't know, I would just say, yeah, it's postural, postural dysfunction, really. Like, yeah. Like you were asking about my own shoulder injury, right? Yeah. I mean, whatever sent you to rehab the first time. And oh, the, second the first time. time. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. The first time. Yeah. That when I was like quite young, actually I was like reaching for a pen and then my friend just like, was, I don't know. I don't know if they were trying to scare me or something, but grabbed and yanked on my shoulders. So at the time I didn't know what it was, but I would say now it was SI joint, but, and then I didn't tell anybody because I was so scared. I, I wanted to keep playing volleyball. Um, so I had actually like pretty bad pain. I remember being like 16 and like 
crying when I was like trying to sit in the car and get in the car. And then finally I told someone and, and I got better. Right. So I would say, I don't know, it just like puts you in a different perspective when I treat younger, younger clients now or patients now and saying like, like, it's okay to tell me Like, they're just so scared for you to take them out of sport. And cause it's like their life, right? Like that's their jam in high school. Like that's, and it was a big deal to me. So I think it just puts you, you got, I have to put myself in that mindset again, when I'm treating that younger population that, yeah, like it could become a long-term thing and you don't want that. So. And then the second time, what happened? Uh, second time, see, I always kind of around, uh, what was it? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I had a nerve pain. Uh, I think I had like, um, what was it? I'm trying to remember. I think again, like just some weakness in my shoulder and I did, I can't remember what movement even, and wow, it feels so long ago, but I remember having like a pinch nerve or some type of pinch nerve and I had radiating nerve pain down my hand and in my neck. And then I had to go back to volleyball. That was my second year playing volleyball. And uh, yeah, that was just a really scary moment for me. And then I went to physio and we got that, that nerve pain um, down and, but yeah, nerve pain is uh, no joke. So it really, again, I guess all those experiences can help me understand like what someone would be going through, I guess, with um, when they come to me, like, cause nerve pain is, it's just a whole other level. Right. But anyway, so that would have been my injury. I believe it would be pinch nerve. Any flare ups? Um, like I would, I would say like my SI joint, that first injury, it'll come and go, but then I just do some like um, glute strengthening <laughs> and um, make sure that I'm moving. Like it's, it's more like, it's so funny. It's when I'm inactive it acts up, right? So COVID, lots of sitting, not good. Um, so yeah, if I can preach anything to people, it's about staying moving. And if you have a therapist or someone that tells you, like if they say rest, but then rest with good movement, that's fine. But they tell you to just do nothing, run away. Or not run away, but just get a second opinion because movement is medicine. Get your ass <laughs> up. Yeah, that's basically like just that. get moving. Like well, thank you so much for uh, coming onto this podcast, Christy. Uh, if you have anything, any closing statements or anything you want to plug, feel free to do so right now. Yeah. Um, just, it was really great meeting you and talking to you and that if uh, anyone ever has any questions, feel free to reach out to me, ha, reach out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I think that's it. Other than just, it was really great meeting you. And I, I obviously, I just really love my job and and I just want to promote movement and, um, and that you don't have to live with pain. You can find ways to either manage or strengthen so you can prevent getting pain. So I know people are out there and they just feel like, well, this is just a part of my life. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, I thank you for being one of the very thoughtful, caring therapists out there. And thank you. we'll be in touch. Um, if you have a screenshot or a picture of you in action or a professional photo, uh, and you can... Would you please send that to me just so I can make it yeah. the thumbnail of this video? Sure, sure. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you so like, much wait, again. Like volleyball professional or just like? Um, therapist professional. Okay. I mean, okay. it doesn't have to be like, you know, super formal or anything. Okay. But maybe like a, a, a picture of you doing some manual therapy or something. Cool. Perfect. All right. Have All a right, great have rest great of your day. day. See you. Take it easy. You too. Bye-bye.